chapter. Never thought I'd get to that one, did you? Revelation 21. We're going to be looking at this particular chapter, cover a little bit of it tonight, uh, get more into detail into it next week. But as we look at this new heaven and new earth, if you would once again, let us look again at what Charles read. Refresh your memory one more time. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Notice, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And do you see, it says there was no more sea. We'll explain what that sea is. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. I'd like for you to focus as we look at this on basically the threat lamb on the throne. I'm trying to get as close to a picture as I could get. I know that that's not Jesus sitting there, but picture uh, whatever spiritual form he's in, sitting on his throne. This chapter that we're fixing to cover has not been as much a contention as chapter 20 has been. However, this particular chapter contains lots of different theories that have been taught concerning this chapter than any chapter revelation in the Bible. You've got the theories that this is going to happen pre-trib, trib, post-trib, as to when this is going to occur. Many, for some reason, seem to lose their whole purpose when they begin to read this particular chapter. It's like they just go off into another land here and don't follow chapter to the next chapter to the next chapter to the next chapter. Revelation is like reading a book. Next chapter leads to the next chapter, leads to the next chapter, leads to the next chapter, leads eventually to the end. That's how you read it. It's still the process of knowing that the opening of this book when we first started was the opening with the seven seals. And not only that, we know that it was taken from the hand of God who sat on the throne. <coughs> then in chapter 4, basically, it is the whole story of Christ as the Lamb slain <coughs> coming to the throne. Now, if you remember, if you go back with me, chapter 4, he came to take the book, and I know you remember what the purpose of him taking the book was. The purpose of him taking the book was to break the seven seals that bound it. That's why he reached in and grabbed that book. The reason that he was given that book is because he had been slain, and because he had been slain, and had redeemed people out of every nation and tongue and kindred. He had basically made them a kingdom of priests, and he was worthy through the slain and dying sinless and being resurrected. He was worthy to take that book and to break those seals. Now the scene that we looked at in the beginning of chapters 4 and 5, of what took place basically is no different than the closing scene that we are going to look at in 
chapter 21 and 22. If you remember, he's coming to the throne because he had been slain and because he had conquered when we first talked about this in 4 and 5. In other words, he is sitting upon the throne and reigning. So this story here tells about all that happened, all the things that took place that were told to John between chapter 4 and 21. Now notice, one opens with the victory of the Lamb slain. The other opens with the Lamb on the throne. Now think about it. We open with four. He's worthy to go, to take the book, to break the seals. We go on down the line to finally get to 21, where now he's able to sit on the throne. The question is, when has all this begun to happen? Well, it began with the cross, and it consummated on the day of Pentecost. Now let's talk about what we've learned already, so this will all fall into place. The old Jerusalem, you remember, was removed, and her ordinances were nailed to the cross. It says then the new Jerusalem was brought in, and it was brought in as we know it by the gospel of Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost told to us in Acts the second chapter. This is what the entire book is about. The ending of the old covenant and the beginning of the new covenant. And it is told in Revelation of all the things that had to be done spiritually and all the things that had to be done in order to get rid of the old covenant, nail it to the cross, get it out of the way, so that Christ could then give us a new covenant, could give us the beginning of the new. No wonder it's called the revelation of Jesus Christ. This chapter, chapter 21, it is more easily, it's a more easily read chapter than any chapter in the book of Revelation. Even though it has more theories than other denominations and evangelicals and people preaching from the pulpit want to take 21 and turn it into some kind of Star Wars thing. All this erupting of all these things and when all this is going to take place. The reason that chapter 21 is such an easy chapter in which to understand is because the reason is more explanation given verse by verse. If you would notice verse 2, if you're looking, is an explanation of verse 1. And verse 3 is an explanation of verses 1 and 2. <coughs> now in verse 1, if you're looking there, we have a new heaven and a new earth. In verse 2, they are called the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ. And in verse 3, they are explained as being the tabernacle of God with man. God is their God, and they are his people. Now go on a little further down to verse 5. It shows the perfection of the new world in which they shall live. With God as their Lord, look what happens. God shall wipe away all tears. Old things have passed away, and all things have become new. Why? Because the lamb slain has conquered. And because he's conquered, he is sitting upon the throne. In verse 6, it says and shows he's completed his work. Notice what it says. It says it is done. Also says he's Alpha and Omega. The first and the last, as was told when we opened up Revelation in Revelation 1. Now I believe that's 1 and verse 8, if I'm correct, that he is, or 18, is told to be the first and the last. I want to make sure I've got the right. Verse 8, Revelation 1 and 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to 
become the Almighty. So as you see here, you see the same. I'm the first and the last. I'm Alpha and Omega. Here it's being repeated again in 21 as it started out saying he was that in chapter 1. Therefore, the true facts are told to John in chapter 1 of who, of who Christ was, and now it is being confirmed to John in chapter 21 that that's true. That he is the first and the last. He is the Alpha and the Omega, and there's no disputing it. In fact, when we started out in chapter 1, Christ was the Alpha and Omega, and notice he was walking in the midst of the churches in chapter 1. And then after the vision is then shown to John, he understands it all very clearly. The churches in chapter 1 are the new heaven and the new earth in chapter 21. And that's what I'm going to try to show you if time allows me. The churches of the new Jerusalem, the new bride, and the new tabernacle. The churches are God's people instead of the old Jerusalem. Instead of the old tabernacle are the old nations of the earth. Notice what there is. There's a new throne, and there is a new king who can wipe away all tears. I bet I don't have to ask you who that is. The whole purpose of the coming, of him coming as a lamb slain in the scriptures, from the foundation of the world, it says in this verse, is finished. He says it is done. So instead of the wells of water dug by Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, if you remember that they did that, there is now a fountain of water of life that is available so everybody can drink from that well. The children of God now can inherit all things, for they were unable to inherit anything based upon the old law. And what about the Lamb? The lamb has become the lion of the tribe of Judah. He reigns as the king immortal. So I say to you, what a vision, what a rapture for John. Now think about the old Jerusalem. What happened to it? It burned. Who destroyed it? It had been destroyed by Rome. So their capital was gone, but why worry? It's no longer the capital, for they have a new city. They have a new heaven. They have a new earth, which is their capital. And notice my last part of the slide here. There's a new throne with God sitting upon it. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth that we read in Revelation 19 and verse 6. Now for all of those that wanted to accept the Lamb and want to worship the Lamb who's sitting on the throne, for all those that wanted that, they have the ability to have it. And they are able, as Christians, to reign as priests on earth while he sits at the right hand of God on his throne in heaven. And he's given us the church in order to keep carrying out his wishes. But what about the one that aren't accepting the Lamb, that aren't wanting to be part of God, who's Christ who sits on the throne, who doesn't want to participate in what the Lamb has done for you and I. What's left for them? Only the wrath of God. Would you look over at chapter 21 and look at verse 8. All the glorious things given to the righteous are not so with the fearful, the unbelieving, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, idolaters, 
And notice this next one. How many lives? Just a few of them? How many lives you see in there? All of them. Don't leave any of them out. All the liars. Got any liars in America you know of? Got any people on the media lying? Got people lying every day to you? Do you know when you look over at the NIV, it says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars. Now notice what it says here. They have their place in the lake of fire which burneth with brimstone, which is the second death. The, King, the NIV says their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. You know it's a pretty good indication that there just might be some levels of torment here. Because it says they have their place in that lake of fire. If they have a certain place that is their part that they're at, they might be in a little different status than someone else who's in their place. Now this is the second death. You know why they have process of the second death? Because they never took care of the first one. What was the first death they never did? They never died with him in here. They never participated in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They never died in the Lord. And now here comes the second death, and they can't escape this one, man. 21 and 8 says they don't have a choice. This is what's going to happen to them because they can't escape it because they never took care of the first one. They avoided it and didn't want to have anything to do with it. And because of this, they refused to reign with the Lamb. They rebelled against the new order of the church. They would not accept the Lamb as their king. Therefore, they're cast into a lake of fire. See, that was the, con the consequences of the old Jerusalem, the old nation of God's people who lived upon the earth. It says God had taken away their kingdom away from them and gave it to another people. Do you remember how many times I talked about Matthew 8 and 12 says that he had cast out the children of the kingdom in the outer darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. And remember we, how we talked that the old people had become a whore, that God had divorced her, cast her out. Remember we talked about how he plagued her and he had taken a new bride, pure and white. We talked about that in 19. In 19, we talked about the marriage of the Lamb had come, and without doubt, without doubt, it came on the day of Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus. And then we looked at it now in Ephesians 5, 23 through 32, says we are married unto Christ now. Flesh of his flesh and bone of his bones, we are one with Christ. We're one in Christ, not only that way, but we're one with Christ spiritually. Married to him. He's the one who is the one. That as we're married to him, we don't try to cause adultery against him. We don't try to have fornication against him. And we don't try to do anything against him because he is the one we're married to. We're supposed to love him. And he also told us to also, let me give you an example of what he gave the example of. He says, let me tell you how to love. Husbands, you love your wives. Just like I love the church and gave myself for it. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful love described as to how we are to love. As I want to talk to you about this one before I let you leave tonight, the New Jerusalem. The 
The term Jerusalem that you see in your scriptures here became a metaphor for the city of the people of God. Now it is used specifically as the church in so many passages. In fact, in Isaiah, I believe 65, 17 through 19, it uses the term New Jerusalem to refer to the church in prophecy. And then, if you'll also look, the Apostle Paul said in Hebrews 12, in no uncertain terms, makes it clear that the church is the heavenly Jerusalem. And then again, in Galatians 4 and 26, it says, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now, remember how I told you there were some theories that kind of go around? concerning chapter 21? The question is not seen as to whether the term is or is not the church, New Jerusalem, because every book that I have read and everybody that talks about this particular chapter, they seem to accept this truth that the New Jerusalem is the church. The question then is, in Revelation 21, when is Revelation 21 taking place? Is it before or after the resurrection or the return of Christ. Several arguments can be made basically to show that it cannot be after the resurrection or the return of Christ. I know of no argument that can be made to prove it is after. Now there are many that hold on to this belief that you can read about but I don't consider an argument. I, I, I see it as uh, them reading the book of imagination. Let's talk about the first one here, and that is the throne argument. If you notice in Revelation 21, Christ is sitting upon the throne in Revelation 21. The Lamb is the light of the temple, it says, of the New Jerusalem. Now, I'd like for you to look at Revelation 21, 22, and verse 1. Go over to the next book, the last book. In Revelation 22 and 1, it says the throne is called the throne of God and the Lamb. Therefore, it must be before the return of Christ at the resurrection. Also, in 1 Corinthians 15, 23 through 28, it says that at the resurrection, Christ will deliver the kingdom, the new Jerusalem, up to God the Father and become as one of us. As long as Christ is sitting on his throne, his reign is incomplete. When it is complete, he will leave the throne and he will deliver the kingdom up to the Father. <laughs> so this is the situation we have then in Revelation 21 and Revelation 22. And according to Acts 1 and 11, which I already had up there, it is during the reign of Christ and it must precede his return to earth. Then there is the priest argument. They say that while Christ in Revelation, let me put this up there, Revelation 1, 5 through 6, says that while Christ sits upon the throne as king and high priest, it says the members of the church serve as priests of God. If you're a priest, raise your hand in here. You sure are. Who's your king? Where does he sit? Who does he sit next to? God Almighty. When he leaves that throne up there, he's on his way back to get you and I. So he sits on that throne until he's ready for him to deliver the church up to God, the Father. And he won't do it until he leaves that throne and comes here because that's what he has to do. That's the last thing that he does. There are only two places in the new tabernacle as in the old tabernacle. Do you remember what those were? You had the holy and the most holy places. In Hebrews 9, 23 and 24, see if I have that. 
It says the high priest served in the most holy place was the type of heaven itself. And the common priest served in the holy place, which was a shadow of the church on earth. Therefore, you can only come to the conclusion that as long as Christ is high priest, the church is still on earth. And as long as we serve as priests unto God, Christ must be in heaven at the right hand of God. So Christ is sitting at the right hand of God in heaven in chapter 21 and chapter 22. Therefore, 21 must be on earth and before the return of Christ. Furthermore, it is also stated the tabernacle of God is with men. Nations still exist, don't they? And bring their glory and honor into it. Nations will not exist after the return of Christ because it tells us in 2 Peter 3 and 10 that at the return of Christ, the earth shall melt with fervent heat. There isn't going to be any more nations. And there isn't going to be any more... There's going to be any more earth. The Bible says that when he returns, that Roll away the heavens with a mighty noise. And that the earth will melt with fervent heat. I used to kind of ask myself, well, is he just going to make that sun come in and just take over the earth? And that sun that's out there is actually going to turn it into that ball of fire that's going to burn up the earth and everything. Second Peter 3 and 10, that it melts with fervent heat. And in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 17, it says, the resurrection will be called up to meet him in the air. And in Revelation 20 and 15, it says, all the unrighteous will be cast into the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. What tells us is going to happen? Then there's the coming down argument. Once we get through this last argument, then we're going to get into the heart of 21. And next time you come back, I'm going to talk to you about this God who's going to wipe away all tears. I'm going to tell you how, how you're doing that and what's going to happen. But as priests, are you working for the Lord? Are you daily encountered in the trying to serve Him while we wait? his return and before we close our eyes we need to be working in his vineyard and trying to bear as much fruit as possible I'm going to tell you what Robert always says he says love is very important but so is loving the Lord and loving the Lord enough that since he died for us we give of ourselves in love by trying to bring someone else to Christ. So that those that are mentioned in 21.8 don't include some of those that we've never talked to. Try to reach out this week if you can. Try to talk to at least one person. Thank you.